I have done judgment and justice. Leave, in, leave me not to mine oppressors. Be surety for thy servant for good. Let not the proud oppress me. Mine eyes fail for thy salvation and for the word of thy righteousness. Deal with thy servant according unto thy mercy, and teach me thy statutes. I am thy servant, give me understanding, that I may know thy testimonies. It is time for thee, Lord, to work, for they have made, weight, made void thy law. Therefore I love thy commandments above gold, yeah, above fine gold. Therefore I esteem all thy precepts concerning all things to be right, and I hate every false way. Ein stands for seventy, and means several things, among which are to insert or to enter, to drink something a second time, or to clean. Verse 121 can be Davidic or Messianic. The petition is based on works, not grace. Verse 122, he is asking God to go bail for him. Isaiah chapter 38, for 14 illustrates. The idea is, I have, constructed, I have contracted an obligation I cannot fulfill. So Lord, you fulfill it for me. Do it for my good, so I can do good. Verse 123 is like verses 20, 22, 28, 40, and especially 82. Verse 124 is self-explanatory. Verse 125 is Messianic and Davidic. Verse 126, the time referred to is Daniel's 70th week, when God's law, Daniel chapter 7, verse 25, has been made void. It's time, inspirationally speaking, for God to work when Israel is being destroyed. The Bible is being done away with Jesus Christ, is being reviled and blasphemed, or, or else fails. Verses 127 and 128 go together. Note again that hate is an essential virtue in the life of saint. There are no dedicated saints in either testament who don't hate something with a purple passion. If a man hates every false way in the 21st century, he will have to get a list longer than his arm. For falsehood is the order of the day in politics, music, art, entertainment, law, religion, Christian colleges, seminaries, revision committees, psychiatry, and the news media. The commandments are worth more than fine gold, literally. They are so valuable that the psalmist says that every decision that God makes and every move that he makes in line with his precepts is right. They are right even when they appear to be not right. God's comments on any matter is the correct evaluation of that, of that matter. See Psalm 119 verse 160. Note the negative par parallelism. One good reason for esteeming the scriptures to be more valuable than gold is the attitude that is taken by men against them. That is according to Luke 16 verse 15. The best reason for considering the scriptures to be worth more than the contents of the Federal Reserve vaults is the fact that educated religious people, pimps and junkies, Bible rev revisers and translators, prostitutes and sex perverts, Catholic priests and bishops, rapists and whoremongers, communists and atheists treat them like dirt. See verses 21, 53, 118, 126. These are proof positive that they are worth millions. The reason David brings up the matter of gold is because the love of money is the root of all evil. 1 Timothy chapter 6 verse 10. In a King James Bible, not in the Revised Version, Revised Standard Version, New Revised Standard Version, Authorized Standard Version, New Authorized Standard Version, New International Version, or New King James Version. This is the actual testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ and Paul, Job, Jeremiah, Moses and David don't attain this height. Thy testimonies are wonderful, therefore that my soul keep them. The entrance of thy words giveth light, 
It giveth understanding unto the simple. I open my mouth and pant it, for I long for thy commandments. Look thou upon me, and be merciful unto me, as thou used to do unto those that love thy name. Order my steps in thy word, and let not any iniquity have dominion over me. Deliver me from the oppression of man, so will I keep thy precepts. Make thy face to shine upon thy servant, and teach me thy statutes. Rivers of waters run down mine eyes, because they keep not thy law. P stands for 80, and probably signifies a mouth. Verse 129 is self-explanatory. Verse 130 is crucial. It goes with Isaiah chapter 28 verse 9, Luke chapter 10 verse 49, and 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verses 19 to 20. All three of which line up with what we just learned in verses 98 to 100. Its words, not God's word, like big capital first letter, that give light. It's not the fundamentals of the faith that give it light. The word of God, with big capital letter word, or messages found in translations, doesn't give light. It's the entrance of thy words, see verses 9 and 11, that gives light. No words, no light. In the depraved thinking of the Adamic intellect, this would mean that unless you had the Hebrew words that God gave to Moses, Joshua, Samuel, David, et al., you couldn't get any light. And therefore, being simple, you would be dependent upon those that professed to have them. Some party line, some cultic mentality, same tune, same key. Fortunately, these liars cannot prevent any of the simple from getting light because they already have the words and the entrance of thy words give it light, chunk the educated chunkies. The word of God travels faster than any other. It exposes everything that is in the dark or hidden, see Mark chapter 4 verse 22. It was originally spoken into existence, Genesis chapter 1 verses 3 to 4. It makes anything obscure. It makes any decision about anything safer and easier. Thy word is a light. It is this. Men's books conform to each other, or they reform some man, or they inform some man, or they misinform some man. There is only one that can transform any man, and it's not anything written by Plato, Aristotle, Socrates, Hegel, Spinoza, Descartes, Sartre, Kierkegaard, Hemingway, Steinbeck, Fichte, Schelling, Marx, Darwin, Huxley, Paley, Peel, Freud, Planck, Einstein, Aguinas, Russell, Devere, James, Glasser, or anyone like them. Verse 131, this panting and thirsting for righteousness is like Psalm 38 verse 10 and 42 verse 1. Verse 132, you are used to, ha used to having mercy on those that love you. Exodus chapter 34, verse 6 and 7. It's a custom with God. Those who love his name have a double claim on mercy. First, because God is merciful to the unjust. Matthew chapter 5, verse 45. And second, he has extra mercy for those that love him and keep his commandments. Exodus chapter 20, verse 6. Verse 133, spiritual speaking. Put my feet on the right path so sin will have no dominion over me. Romans chapter 6, verses 12 to 14. He doesn't want sin to reign in his mortal body that he should await in the lust thereof. It's more needful in God's sight to have this prayer answered than the one in the next verse. Verse 134 is like verses 81, 86, 87, and 95. Verse 135, devotionally, as in number 6, Verse 25, look upon me with favor and let me feel a sense of thy presence like Moses felt when he dealt with the, the face to face. Exodus chapter 34 verse, verse 29. Prophetically a prayer in the tribulation, see Psalm 67 verse 1 and chapter 80 verse 1. 
verse 136, Jeremiah condition before and after the destruction of Jerusalem. See Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, in Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 1, 18, and chapter 14, verse 17, Lamentation chapter 1, verse 16. Jati, righteous art thou, O Lord, and upright are thy judgments. Thy testimonies that thou hast commanded are righteous and very faithful. My zeal hath consumed me, because mine enemies have forgotten thy words. Thy word is very pure, therefore thy servant loveth it. I am small and despised, yet do not I forget thy precepts. Thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and thy law is the truth. Trouble and anguish have taken hold on me, yet thy commandments are my delights. The righteousness of thy testimonies is everlasting. Give me understanding, and I shall live. Chardi is 90 in Gematria and means several things, to descend or to bow down, to rattle or to tinkle, and some roots trace it back to words that mean to heap or heap up and to incline. Verse 137 is self-exclamatory, as in verse 138. Righteous, upright, righteous and very faithful are the adjectives that describe God's judgment and, dest and testimonies. Verse 139 can be messianic. The meat in it, however, for you time, is the shocking statement that one of the marks of God's enemies is the fact that they for forget his words, not his testimonies, principles, teachings, statutes, ju judgments, precepts, or his word. With big first capital letter. Christ says that, that an enemy of God is marked by the fact that he will not listen to God's words, not his fundamentals, precepts, principles, teachings, creeds, beliefs, instructions, or main doctrines. God's word had proved itself to be tried, refined, and purified like gold, and also absolutely perfect, inerrant, and infallible. Catch, not one word is in the present tense, he put it all in the past. We can say, Thy word is very pure. See Psalm chapter 12, verses 6 to 7. So then, if a man was really pure, he would love it. Beyond that, if he were dirty, he had a yearning and desire to be pure, he would love it. Strange kind of uh, so called purity we have these days. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5, and chapter 3, verse 9, Titus chapter 2, verse 7 which uses a book it doesn't believe in, and then pollutes it daily by pretending that it, that it needs purifying. Thy word is very pure, therefore thy servant loveth it. If you love pur purity, you will love it. If you are impure, it will repel you. A pure Bible couldn't come from an impure source. The motives had to be right. Would the polluted age enjoy a pure Bible? Could very pure be said of anything that a natural man wrote without divine intervention, if under the pure all things are pure? Titus chapter 1 verse 15. How does a said Bible teacher fail to find purity in the authorized version, knowing its fruits and its track record for more than 400 years? A corrupt tree cannot bring forth good fruit, let alone pure fruit. Verse 141 is clear. What is small in man's eyes is not small in God's eyes. See Zechariah chapter 4 verse 10. God chose the things that were despised, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 28, to confound the mighty. Verse 142 is expounded on in Isaiah chapter 42 verse 6 and 21. Chapter 51, verse 6. In the New Testament, this righteousness shows up Romans chapter 3, verse 21 and 22, 25 and 26, and it's everlasting. Note, however, the little doctrinal discord, and thy law is the truth. In the New Testament, Jesus converts this to thy word is truth, John chapter 17, verse 17. 
for there are no legal additions to God's righteousness in the New Testament. Romans chapter 10 verse 1 to 6. Christ fulfilled this law as the truth. So this explains why he says John 17, 17. Verse 143 is like verses 82, 87, 92 and 110. Practically speaking, no man can delight in the things of this world when he is in trouble and anguish. He will have to delight in something spiritual. Verse 144 is clear. It's trouble and anguish. Verse 143 that motivate men to depart from evil. From verses from verse 144 we learn that man is without any real understanding. Understanding cannot be found in science, philosophy, education or Christian scholarship. Understanding must be asked for. See verse 18. It will be obtained from the giver of every good and perfect gift. James chapter 1 verse 17. Kof, I cried with my whole heart, Hear me, O Lord, I will keep thy statutes. I cried unto thee, Save me, and I shall keep thy testimonies. I prevented the dawning of the morning and cried, I hope in thy word. Mine eyes prevent the night watches, that I might meditate in thy word. Hear my voice according unto thy loving kindness, O Lord, quicken me according to thy judgment. They draw nigh that follow after mischief, they are far from thy law. Thou art near, O Lord, and all thy commandments are truth. Concerning thy testimonies I have known of old that thou hast found it them forever. Kop stands for 100 and denotes the whole of an axe. That is the hole in the axe head into which the handle is stuck. Verses 145 and 148 are plain. The psalmist first cried with his heart. Verse 145. Second cried with an undivided heart. Verse 145. Cried to God. Verse 146. Cried to God early, verse 148. Cried to God in the night, verse 148. The night plays a great part in the psalm. See Psalm chapter 78, verse 14. You can have light in the night. Auroras, a pillar of how a pillar of fire, house lights, street lights, moonlight, starlight, fireflies, phosphorus, vehicle lights. You can have alarms in the night, Gideon's attack, the coming of the bridegroom, burglaries, fire alarms, the reports of listening post in World War I, the Lord speaking to you, first Samuel chapter 3 verses 1 to 6, and warning you, Abimelech, Genesis chapter 20 verse 3. You can have rest in the night, Psalm chapter 4 verse 8 and chapter 127 verse 2. You can have watchfulness in the night. Night prayer vigils, sentries, security guards on patrol and night watchmen going about the city. Song of Solomon chapter 3 verse 3 and waiting for the second coming. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verses 1 to 10. You can have songs in the night like Paul and Silas sang or Christ himself. Matthew chapter 26 verse 30 or like Schubert and Mozart composed when they were sick and dying. You can have destruction in the night, like Belshazzar's feast. Verse 146 is plain. In verse 147 he has been praying all night. This is messianic, according to Luke chapter 6 verse 12. Verse 148 is the same thing. Except here he hasn't stayed awake to pray, but to think about what he had read in thy word. Notice David's constant resort to the written law of God when under persecution or in real danger. Verses 134 and 143, 157, 161, etc. Verse 149 is plain. Verse 150 is plain. Where, when a sinner draws nigh to mischief, then he cannot draw nigh unto God. See James chapter 4, verse 8. Men draw near to harass, tempt, kill, discourage, and implant doubt. God draws near, verse 151, to warn, protect, encourage, comfort, help, strengthen, and save. 
Verse 151, God is near when the enemy is near. Verse 152, they were known of old, in that they were around more than 500 years before David was born, Moses. But even more than that, they were founded forever, in the sense that they were around before the mountains were settled before the hills. Proverbs chapter 8, verse 25, because the incarnate wisdom of God was with Father before the foundation of the world. John chapter 17, verse 24. In the beginning of this way, before his works of old. Proverbs chapter 8, verse 22. This means that David knew more than Einstein, Freud, Marx and Darwin combined. For those men didn't know how they got here, where they came from, where they were going or what to do while they were here. David knew, so did Peter, James, John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, Paul, and 500 million Christians at least, 100 under Domini, until now, like them.